Welcome to the talk show, Lighting the Educational Flame, with your host, Mark Hoberman. The goal of this show is to provide a learning experience to people of all ages, with guests from various fields and academics, a wide range of industries, and insight into the many forms of art, athletics, and entertainment. We hope you enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to the talk show, Lighting the Educational Flame, brought to you by Great Success Education. I'm your host, Mark Oberman, and my co-host today is Susan Brender. How are you doing today, Susan? I'm doing fine, and thank you for um, having me as your host, uh, co-host. Actually, it's a pleasure. Thanks so much. Great to see you as always. Boy, today we have a real special guest because, as you know, I was an English teacher for, for many years, but not so good in math and not so great in science, but we have somebody today who's a superstar in science, and she really has... Uh, is on some path to greatness and has done a lot of awesome things with regards to science and with NASA itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you something, Mark, she's going to be an amazing guest. And the reason is because when you are, when you work as a scientist with NASA, there's nothing better than that. No, that's, that's top notch. That's, that's a household name. That's like Pepsi or Coca-Cola, but smarter. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so uh, let's bring her on. Okay. Our guest today is Space Policy Analyst at the IDA Science and Technology Policy Institute, Rachel Lindbergh. Rachel, welcome to Lighting the Educational Flame. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Mark and Susan. I'm really excited to, uh, to join y'all today. So good to see you. Rachel, when did you first find your passion for science? That's a great question. I initially was way more of a history and English buff. Um, it wasn't until some point in high school when I had this fantastic teacher, Miss Kelly Voigt, who brought a really interesting STEM project or program to our school. It's the Student Space Flight Experiments Program. And it involves, a community will join and the students in the community, they write proposals and they meet with mentors and they submit for a spot on the International Space Station for their own experiment. And I kind of joined as like a resume buff. I was like, you know, I don't really care about space. I used to be one of those awful people who's like, why do we spend money up there anyway? Um, but being involved in such a cool program really ignited a passion in me that I did not know existed, which was absolutely fantastic experience. I very much you know, enjoyed it. Rachel, I'll tell you something very interesting. Um, we've actually, Mark and I, have worked with people with NASA. And it's a fascinating, fascinating place. But here's, here's the question to you. You know, we've been paying so much attention to everything that albeit the you know, the virus. And that has been like on first on the, the if you will, first on the, the discussions that everybody is having. But NASA, you don't hear about it that much anymore. Why is that? I think, I think you're right. It's uh, less in the national forefront and it is too bad because I think we're really at a very fascinating point in our history. I think the American space program used to just be a representation of the American people. It was something that engineers and astrophysicists did and you and I weren't that connected to it on an individual level. But nowadays space is democratized. We use satellites for every part of our daily life, not just telling where to go on your phone, but we use it to monitor crops, we use it to monitor weather. We even use it to track pirates on, on the sea. And hmm. students like I used to be and like that you have, they, um, can be involved in STEM programs that actually let them send things to space or use space data. It's a very interesting time where it's not just a representation of the American people. The American people can participate more than ever before in space exploration. I'm not sure exactly why people are less involved. I wish I knew, because I think it's, a, it's one of the very few ways you can participate in exploration of the universe. I'd love people to be more involved. I think maybe people just don't know how accessible it is. They still think of it as like, Russia and the U.S. in space fighting and throwing missiles at each other, which isn't the case anymore. You know, I love I love what you just said. And you know why? Because there's su such a divisiveness between America and the Soviet Union or Russia, as we call it. And here is something that brings us together. OK, science going up in space, doing everything that you know, experiments, but it's all together and we don't have any problems working with them at all. And I'm just curious from your standpoint, whether you've ever met a Russian scientist and had discussions with them and young people talking together and sharing all their knowledge. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, luckily through my job, uh, so I work at Science Technology Policy Institute, but we were made by Congress to support the White House. So a lot of my work is internationally focused, some of it's domestic. I have had the opportunity to talk with some Russian scientists about different space problems, which has been really fun and really enlightening. I think we get, in most other domains, like you're saying, it's very adversarial, but in space, we've been partners with the Russians and for sure so many years, even back to the Apollo missions, we did joint projects with them. So it's been a, it's a really, interesting domain in that it is so collaborative and has been peaceful thus far and I really hope we can keep it that way. Unfortunately I haven't gotten a chance to meet uh, Russian students or people my age but hopefully soon but um, we're very lucky to have space as a very peaceful collaborative domain where we all can work together to understand our place in the universe. Rachel uh, when you talked about uh, your, you, you were never really interested in, in science per se how old were you when you got you first got involved I didn't hear the age when you, when you gave your answer. I was 16, I was a junior in high school, right. which I feel really lucky to do that. I feel like it's an opportunity that a lot of people could have had like 10, 10 years ago even. Right, well, well definitely it's, it's a little depressing to me and Susan, because to me, it looks like you were 16 last week. So, <laughs> you're so young, uh, uh, a female in science, which is, there's, in, in for decades, historically, there have been too few people in mathematics and mm -hmm. certainly in science. And, you know, so glad that you did this as a student and, and not like, oh, nine years old on a field trip. So what would you like students to know about space exploration and space policy? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that students should realize that now we're in a really fascinating time in space, like I mentioned, where they can be a part of the American space program not just through STEM pro projects like mine, but there's a tomato sphere project where they send your classroom tomato seeds that flew on the ISS and you get to grow them and submit that data to NASA on how do things grow differently after being exposed to space? Or you can just use space data every day to do fun experiments. You can be involved in space in a way you've never been able to. And I also wish people realized that it's not just the domain of engineers and astrophysicists anymore. I mean, I. I studied public policy in Russia in college. I, for a while, I thought, oh, I wish I could do space, but there's no way I can do it. I have this passion that I have to put aside, but we live in a very interdisciplinary world. More and more, you really need to draw on the expertise of so many fields to do, do anything. I work with space economists. I work with space policy people. I work with space entrepreneurs. There's so much expertise that can be drawn from other fields that helps. And this is not just true in space. I think it's especially true in space, but I think any field you can think of really needs all kinds to make it work. So what I always tell kids is, even if you excel in one field don't or one subject, don't think that you're limited to that. You can blend all of your passions and we live in a world in which uh, that's possible, which is really exciting. Mark, I, I'm interested in uh, talking about if when you were a teacher, I'm, a, I'm going back in time a little bit, not that many years, but needless to say, you did it, okay? now. If you had a program where you can provide your students with things that Rachel talked about, wouldn't it have been amazing? Yeah, yeah. and as you know, Susan, I'm a tremendous believer in that. I feel that in school, you know, it was over 30 years that I taught, and I only stopped about two and a half years ago. Uh, there, there's too much teaching for the test. There's not enough of real life. I mean, uh, there's no way. I just learned about you know uh, that space is used and, and satellites or tracking pirates. Well, all I know is Pirates of the Caribbean over at Disney World. And I'm learning that you bring people in. And to be honest, to bring somebody in who works with NASA is a great thing. To bring in a female who, was, who works in NASA is a great thing. But to bring someone in who doesn't look like someone from the movies, the old boys club with the famous actors, 37 men in this room tracking satellites and all this. The only woman was bringing them coffee. So this is a big deal. So to answer your question, this, this is, I think, what's missing in education today is bringing in real life and meeting the kids at their own reality. So absolutely, I would have loved to have brought something like this in. You know, you and I bring programs at the school all the time. But when it comes to science, and, and, and again, I think Rachel is so it's the nail on the head when she says that they don't realize that we work together with Russia. They don't realize the policy, which leads me to ask, uh, you know, when we talk about science, why space policy? Why'd you pursue that? Why not physics or engineering? Yeah, well, initially I had started doing physics and 
I just couldn't let go of my other passions of history and policy. I kept thinking, you know, I could do math for the next 10 years in a room by myself, but I don't think that's what would make me happy. But luckily, I was able to engage with a lot of mentors in my field. And I think that um, students should really, I really encourage them to reach out to people. Even if you watch a news story about a scientist or any person, you think, wow, what a cool person. You can find their email. I think people are really excited to help students on their way up with um, learning about the opportunities that are out there and sharing their passions. I would definitely recommend that to people. But um, I started on the physics path, realized I wanted to do more. And luckily, a mentor exposed me to other issues. And I think I'm happy to highlight a couple of science and space policy issues. I think people don't really realize um, how many policy issues there are in space. I think people hear about orbital debris a lot, for example. Uh, anything you send into space can stay there for decades. And the higher up it goes, the longer it stays there. You might think, oh, who cares about a paint chip in space? But because of you know, how much gravity pulls, those little pieces move tremendously fast, sometimes like over 20,000 miles per hour. And when something, even that small hits a satellite at that speed, that's like a grenade in orbit. And those pieces take forever to come down. And there's a lot of policy issues with how do we address that junk? Someone still owns it. Uh, what's the liability issues there? Who needs to do the R&D to address that? One of my other favorite issues I think you might see in the news a bit is I don't know if you follow SpaceX at all, but they have a Starlink satellite constellation that's really exciting. will provide a lot of internet around the world to people who don't currently have it, but it's kind of interfering with astronomy on the Earth. You could see it almost with your naked eye and people who use these huge professional telescopes to try and understand where we are in the universe, they keep seeing these little blips going across. And how do you, how do you weigh the benefit of Starlink, which is a really important socioeconomic thing. So many people can't afford internet and to bring that to people is huge, but also we need, I think the night sky is a part of our shared cultural heritage. So protecting that's important. And that's a policy issue that people wouldn't think about. Yeah, Rachel, um... If you had a chance to um, teach, to be a teacher, maybe just a volunteer for a little bit, dedicate one specific point that you would like to get across to the kids, okay? Because I know that kids will find this fascinating. You know, when it comes to space, everybody really, you know, loves it. So what is the one thing that you would teach to kids and that kids can get something out of it? There are so many things I'd like to say. I think what I'll stick with as my one thing is that space, like every industry, needs all kinds. Don't think, oh, I didn't get into super Harvard with an over-perfect ACT score, so I can't, you know, get an astrophysics degree and help NASA. We need all sorts of people and all sorts of backgrounds in the American space program. You know, whether you're, there's even space historians or space economists, there's all sorts of perspectives you can bring to the table so you shouldn't be deterred because you don't think you have the right background. Excellent, because a lot of people think that they don't really, like, I don't think anybody knew there was such a thing as space policy. I'm sure some adults know, but if, but if I went up to five people and said, give me some policies about space exploration, I don't even know what, an, what answer someone could make up because when you talk <laughs> about policy and also space, most people think that space is a rocket ship goes off, it lands on the moon, that's our space exploration. So what's going on in space that, especially uh, the parents of some teens who, who are our, our viewers, uh, what is it that goes on that's interesting that really doesn't even enter our minds that we take for granted that we don't even realize? I mean, I, the first thing that comes to my head is the International Space Station. We just celebrated 20 years of people living and working in space all the time. So for a lot of the times that your students especially have been alive, there have been Americans and Russians and Japanese and Italian people living and working in space every day. And that's truly amazing. And they're able to do so much research that wouldn't occur to you. I think gravity is something that we take for granted every day. You don't even think about how it affects the way roots grow, the way our bones and muscles are structured. But when you can flip that off and look at things at a more foundational level, there's just so many things that you can discover and it's fascinating. And there's more companies and universities doing this than ever. Even I think Nickelodeon sent uh, some slime to space, which is kind of the fun end, but also, you know, Adidas does experiments in space, Merck Pharmaceuticals and Eli Lilly, uh, Goodyear Tires. There's so much we can learn from space that I don't think people realize. And that's 
supported by our International Space Station. Sometimes I talk to people about space and they don't even realize that we have people in space anymore. So I'd love for people to engage more with that. I'm just curious, um, Rachel, how is our government treating this? Are they um, supporting it? Are they giving you, you know, money to deal with, um, to handle f for some of the things that you're doing? I mean, it's so important. Again, I want to emphasize that there is, you know, right now there's all the emphasis is on the, the pandemic, but there must be something that you can tell us about the support of the government and if they feel that this is a great program. Yeah, I think that it's been more of a priority in recent years than, um, yeah, it's, it's been like I've hoped and it's been more of a priority with every administration. Even the new uh, Biden-Harris administration, they kept the National Space Council, which I think is a really positive indicator of the priority. And I think it's a bit more in the national spotlight than it had been. I think there was a bit of a dark period in the early 2000s where people were feeling bad. We had a lot of really horrible things happen then, but I think people are kind of realizing their space in uh, the space program. So, sorry, that was that was corny, um, no. but <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> but I do think that uh, the government is more and more involved, and I think there's more government agencies involved in space than you might think. I mean, not just um, NASA, which is the obvious one, but the USDA does work in space. Um, the FDA, I think, and there's some obvious like the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, kind of judges it, but. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, they do work in space too. I think that uh, you see more of an interest in leveraging the space environment to do things that we never considered possible before. You know, Mark, I'm interested, you, you probably think about this also, and there are people from different walks of life who were wanting to go up to Mars. I'm talking about like Elon Musk as an example. Now, I'm curious from your standpoint, Rachel, what do you think about them doing that? And would you consider doing it with them going up to space? I mean, it's it's scary. I have to tell you, it's really scary and it takes a long time. So I'm interested in knowing what you think about this. I mean, I think it's really exciting that we'll be able to explore it. Like in our lifetime, people will go to Mars. It might take a bit longer for people to be living and working there the way Elon Musk envisions, but uh, it is a very exciting time. I think I had a personal experience with rocket explosions that maybe makes me less interested in going myself. Um, when my experiment was first chosen, we were on the Orbital 3 rocket, which was my first rocket explosion. We went down to Virginia Beach to watch the uh, launch. We counted down as it lifted off and it blew up right on the launch pad, which was yeah. quite an experience. But you know, space is hard. You know, it's, a, it's an exciting domain, but it's difficult, which is one of the things that makes it so fascinating and I think inspires passion in so many people. It's a real challenge. Um, and luckily, we got a second chance. We're down to Cape Canaveral to watch this launch and uh, counted down, watched it go up, and it exploded again two times in a row. But the third time, it was able to go up on a SpaceX one. I'm so tired of the phrase, third time's a charm, but it's true. I think it's a good lesson for students also that you have to keep chugging along, you know? It's hard, but it's worthwhile. But after that, I think I'm good on the ground. Oh yeah, well, probably on, more than 30 years ago, I had to look this up. When I first started teaching was the year, unfortunately, that the seven astronauts were killed. And one of them was a female, I think, teacher, Krista McCullough. And mm -hmm. uh, we, our school had sub-schools that used to be called the red, the green, and the blue. And then we changed the names. And one of them was the, uh, was, that was the Krista McCullough sub-school. So I just remember that people respect science in that way so much, but you know, you've, you've opened our eyes to so much more that science and space is. But uh, when, when did you in your career first start to do any work at all with the International Space Station? Yeah, it was during that STEM program when I was, when I was 16 and being able to see scientists up close, I had some mentors at NASA who guided us through this experiment and meeting the astrophysicist who runs this project, it really inspired me. I, I, one of our, for our program, we have a big conference every year at the Air and Space Museum in, um, in DC. And the astrophysicist in charge gives a big speech about where we are in the universe. And it was just incredibly inspiring, which again, I use this to highlight, you know, students should really feel comfortable just reaching out to people they find fascinating because people really love to share their passions with students. 
How do you even excited? Oh, sorry. No, I just want to know how your parents feel about what you're doing. Oh, my mom's pretty into it. She likes to tell people that I do stuff in space. Although I have to remind her, I don't work for NASA. I work for um, Stippy for the White House, which I, which I really enjoy. But uh, yeah, I think my, my mom's happy with it. Well, my, my father used to tell people when I was in college, I was taking up space. So that may be the same, <laughs> that may be the same kind of thing. But it, it's so great to talk to somebody because uh, my passion for, for a long time was teaching. And you're teaching now, but I have to tell you that just some career advice or something, you need to get into a classroom even as a guest because your passion for it is infectious. I think that you're, you're a great role model for young people. And uh, it's a tremendous thing that, that you did here. So uh, in closing, what is up? What's next for you? What are you looking at? What are you aspiring to? What's next that we don't know that you already think you might be getting involved with with regard to space exploration and space policy? Yeah, well, I think for the near term, I'm going to continue doing space policy analyst for the White House. It's just a fantastic role to be in and to have a small part in forming some of the big decision makers of our time in space. So I think for now I'm, I'm good here, but I, I'm also mentoring a student at my high school in our AP capstone. So I'm excited to start trying to help students because uh, again, it was so formative for me to have people help me when I was coming up. So I'm excited to finally be in the position where I can help people get started the way I was helped. That's excellent. So I can't thank you enough for sharing your story and more importantly, your passion for us. I think our viewers are gonna be very happy. And uh, thank you to Rachel Lindbergh uh, for being with us today. Susan, as always, thank you. And viewers, don't forget to tune into our next show. This is Mark Hoberman thanking you for watching Lighting the Educational Flame and have a great day. Rachel, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for watching Lighting the Educational Flame. To contact Mark Hoberman, email him at info at gradesuccess.com or visit him on social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Thank you for watching Lighting the Educational Flame.